Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the webinar on marketing and merchandising strategies for local business startups. My name is Dolores Surafin, and I work for Alberta Agriculture and Forestry with the Sector Development section. I will be your host for today's webinar. Before we start, here are a few housekeeping items. If you would like to ask a question, please type it into the question area on your GoToWebinar panel. The presenter will address all questions at the end of the presentation. Also, this webinar is being recorded for your viewing pleasure. The link will be sent to you in an email after the webinar. We will probably take up the majority of the 90 minutes for this webinar um, as there is a lot of information to go through. Hopefully we'll stop with about five minutes to spare for questions and answers. Um, and if you're okay with hanging out later, if we go over the 90 minutes with, with questions, we will try our best to get through everything. Also, Karen, who works in our Grand Prairie office, is experiencing some internet connections, so we may lose her during her presentation, hopefully not, keep your fingers crossed, but just in case there's radio silence for a moment, that may be why. So this webinar explores marketing strategies, including image, display, curb appeal, merchandising techniques, and other tools to attract customers to your business and secure sales. Eileen Katawich and Karen Goad with Alberta and Agriculture, Agri Bleh, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry will be your presenters for this webinar. Karen Goad is the Farm Direct Marketing Specialist with Alberta Agriculture based in Grand Prairie. For over 30 years, she has had the pleasure of working with entrepreneurs and small scale processors across Alberta who sell their food products direct to consumers. Eileen Katowicz is the Provincial Farmers Market Specialist with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. She works closely with the market managers, boards, sponsors, and vendors to help clarify the guidelines and provide coaching on conflict resolution, market rules, bylaws, and regulations. When not out on a boat fishing in the summer, she can often be found visiting our approved farmers markets throughout the province. Eileen and Karen, over to you to share your expertise with all of us. Thank you, Dolores. So um, it's Eileen. I will start the presentation. Karen will take over in the middle and then I will finish things off. And as Dolores said, we have a lot of slides to go through. So if any of you were on our uh, selling local into local food markets last week, we had about 50 slides and we went the full hour and a half. Well, now we have 65 slides with a lot of pictures. So we will talk quickly and hopefully get through. I have set an alarm on my phone to stop within five minutes of the end of it. If we don't get through all the slides, not to worry, we will be sending you a PDF of this presentation along with another presentation with some resource sheets on it. So you'll get a lot of material coming to you via email if we can't get through all of the slides. Okay, so just to get you, give you an idea of, of what we're wanting, what we're wanting to talk about today, talk a bit about the marketing strategy um, and, and the different techniques you can use to market your product. Displays and signage, and this is where we have a lot of pictures of, of some really good tips and, and tricks that other people have used to have effective displays and good signage, and then some promotional tips to, to round out the day. Before we get into any of the pictures, just to, just to remind you that None of these pictures were tapped and taken since the pandemic hit. They've been taken over about the last 10 or 15 years and have been collected over time. So if you don't see people with masks and you don't see people social distancing, that's why. They've, they are older pictures. But as a reminder to you in your business during this time of COVID that everybody must follow the Chief Medical Officer of Health orders and uh, make sure that they're following all of the, the social distancing and increased cleaning and sanitizing protocols that are required out there. Um, any of the orders, if you're not sure, because things are changing pretty quickly with the way COVID is advancing, all of the orders can be found online. So if you go, even if you just go to the alberta.ca slash COVID site, it will Give you all of the information that is updated on a daily basis about the COVID pandemic and the information Alberta Health is putting out. So the orders are there as well as these um, guidance documents that they have put out for those off businesses that are allowed to operate during the pandemic um, specific to specific industries and I've put down a few of them because they should apply to the businesses that some of you are involved in but there are a lot of other um, 
guidance documents in there as well. So please take a look at what's in there. Check the date that's at the end of the, the link that's in there so you'll know when the last time was that it was updated. So to get this started, um, talking about the different marketing strategies and, and curb appeal being the first, the first segment of that. So marketing really is the process of understanding and delighting your customers. And how you do that is through the different marketing strategies and tools such as curb appeal, images, displays, signage, or promotional techniques. So first and foremost, you really want to be um, aware of the first impression that you are, are putting out there for your customers. Um, be aware of what you look like. What, what you know, stand back from your business, stand back from your farmer's market stall and really have a good look at what do they see as they're driving by or as they're walking up. Um, is it attractive? Is it welcoming? Does it uh, portray a consistent image as you're as they are walking in and, and seeing things. Do things make sense and do things work out well together? What stands out? Are there things that maybe could be tweaked and maybe could be tucked away if they're not really appropriate and, and supporting the image and the brand that you are trying to portray? When you think about your image, <clears throat> keep in mind that you as, as the seller, you as the vendor, you as the as the owner of your business, you're part of your display. And so everything that you do from how you lay out your, your store, how you lay out your farmer's market booth, to the clothes that you are wearing, to the vehicles you're driving, all are part of what your image is and the brand that you are trying to get across to people. So this, this gentleman in the bottom right corner is Tony Marshall, who actually owns Highwood Crossing and for not quite a number of years sold at farmers markets in southern Alberta. And Tony always looked the same, very, you know, definitely a farmer, but very clean, very professional looking, always very welcoming. His display was very open. His uh, pricing on his products was always out there so that people could see them. Very consistent, clean image, um, strong brand that he wanted to make sure that people saw. He was very approachable and very knowledgeable and that was how he always wanted to portray himself. This picture in the bottom left corner is um, of the parents of, of some colleagues of ours who have a farm outside of Ottawa, Saunders Farm, and they started out as a strawberry you pick operation. So super simple uh, is what they had, you know, just a table um, out in their field. This was their welcoming table that where they would meet their their customers as they were coming onto the farm to go into the U book. So really simple, but very clean, very welcoming, and, and certainly consistent with their brand. This um, little gem in the top left corner is um, something that was found on a farmer's market table quite a number of years ago, just sort of plunked on there, taped onto the table, written on the back of a cash register receipt, looks horrible, quite frankly, spelling mistakes, um, kind of sloppily written. I guess it serves the purpose, but it you really want to keep in mind, again, what image are you trying to portray and how does, is that consistent with the brand that you, you have out there? What is the impression that you are leaving people with? <clears throat> so when you're thinking about your brand, you want to be aware of of how consistent you are in everything that you are doing, um, from the, the product that you are selling to the messaging that you have, from the labeling on your, your products to, to your staff uniforms, to how you answer your phones, to how you post on social media, and not just your uh, business social media, but also your personal social media, because people will, will snoop through everything and, and creep through everything, and if you are saying things on your personal social media that may be contrary to the image you're trying to portray, that can have an, a detrimental effect on your business. So being credible is, is really trying to tell a consistent story all the time, being truthful and honest, and over delivering on the, the promises that you are that you are giving to your people in in the products that you are telling, in the guarantees that you are providing with your product, and how you are treating your your customers and your staff and everything around you. When you're being compelling, you are trying to 
to make sure that people understand what your story is. Tell your farm story, be proud of your farm story, um, and try to create that desire for them to come back and visit you more and purchase from you again, tell others about your story. And, and your story is also told in how you how you have your packaging, how your labeling is, how your staff are trained, and how people are being treated, the customer service that you're providing. Be creative, do something that is um, special for your customer right from the, the time they enter your facility to the time they leave and make them say, wow, at the end of the day, I really want to go back there and I want to shop from these guys because they really do a great job of what you're doing. Your customer service is so much a part of, of what you're doing. It's about smiling um, and being courteous to your customers. It's about telling your story because people don't get tired of hearing your story. They want to know how you grow your product or how you grow your crops, how you raise your animals, how you create your, your value added products how your kids are doing, how the farm is doing. They want to know that, that sort of information about you. It's also about um, how you learn that, that you're always looking professional, even though you are coming from the farm or you're coming from the kitchen, you're, you're ready to welcome your guests. You're making it right. You're making sure that if they do have a problem with your product, that you, you make it right with them so that they leave a happy customer all the time. Um, this picture is of a parking attendant with Saunders Farm. So that picture I showed you before where they're out, you know, welcoming people at their UPIC. Well, Saunders Farm has morphed several times and now is a huge agritourism operation out just outside of Ottawa. So this is one of the um, staff uniforms that they have. So these guys are parking attendants. All their parking attendants look like this. Um, and so this way, you know, when you get out of your vehicle, I need, just need to look for the guy that's wearing the cone on his head to help me figure out how to get to the sales center, how to get back to my vehicle, how to do the different things that I need to do on the farm. So they've, they've really um, branded their people similar to how Disney does it to make sure that you feel comfortable and you know who to go to on your farm. And always keep in mind that you never get a second chance to make that first impression, that it's it's so important to, to be welcoming and to be consistent in everything that you do so that your first impression is always first and foremost with them and such a positive experience. Consistent messaging is absolutely critical with you and making sure that your actions match, match your messages. So in this particular picture, this is a great idea. You know, you've got a kid's play area. It's it's in a granary, so it's consistent with your farm image. Um, it's out of the elements. The kids can go in there. There's a little bit of a risk management issue here and a little bit of a problem, but here you've got kids playing in a grain bin in the grain. And anybody who lives on a farm and listens to the news right now realizes that there's certainly dangers of leaving your kids anywhere around um, grain in the, the opportunity for them to get into trouble in that sort of situation. So great idea, but not necessarily in this sort of setting where the kids are out of sight and possibly out of mind and potential damages could happen to these poor kids. Thinking about your product, um, when you're taking your product to market, always, always being consistent in the quality that you're bringing to, bringing to the market because you want to make sure that people understand when they come to your store or they come to your, your booth that they're going to get the same type of, of product every time that they, they purchase from you. Make sure that it is your booths and your setups are clean and that they are appealingly displayed so that they are, are welcoming in such a way that people know where to go to get the product that they want and how to find what they're looking for. Make sure that there is sufficient supply. And if you were on the, um, the webinar last week, we talked about some merchandising videos that we had um, Jenny Birkenbosch with Sundog Organics do for us a couple of years ago. And she talks through how to make sure that your, your display always looks abundant, even at the end of the day. You, you don't want to be standing there with just that one bag of carrots, but 
how do you make your booth continue to look abundant and continue to look welcoming for people, even as you've gone through the sales of the day? Think about your different varieties and the different um, options that you have to, to sell to people. So do you sell them only um, one type of tomato and one type of zucchini, or do you have, have different varieties for people to pick from? Do you have different package sizes? So a one pound package of, of fresh carrots versus a five pound bag of carrots, because you're thinking of if people, um, different customers coming and different uses that people may have for those options. So just think about the different options that you can have for people. Real-time inventory is absolutely critical. And we talked about this last time as well, or last week as well, where it's so important that as your sales are happening um, in multiple places at one time, so if you are at a farm store, you're selling and you're also selling online and you're also selling at the farmer's market, that you know at any given time how much inventory you have in stock so that you're not promising something that you can't deliver on, that you're always aware of of how much you have of any given product and you advise your customers if you have gotten to the point where you've sold out. Um, offer different ordering and delivery and payment options. Right now, particularly during COVID, that is so, so critical with how we uh, keep our customers coming back and make sure that they are, are being satisfied and being kept safe and feel like they're being being kept safe. So the different options of ordering online or ordering over the phone, um, different pickup options, whether that's delivered to their door or curbside pickup or whatever that may be. Adding value. Um, anybody who is producing a perishable product understands the importance of doing this and under in in ways to make sure that you're not wasting product. What do you do with leftover product at the end of the day? Are there things that you can do with your product to add value to it? So this picture was taken as a, a reminder that right now our lives are so busy and people are, are running all the time and are there things that you can do that can help make things more convenient for them? So the matchstick carrots or the, the cut up vegetables that they can just pop into their kids lunches or for after school snacks or snacks as they're on the go running out the door to different different practices and different events. Um, this second picture that's come in is uh, a shot of a display that Edgar Farms had at a, at a farmer's market. So Edgar Farms grows a an incredible amount of asparagus and asparagus doesn't necessarily grow all that well in Alberta and certainly when they started um, Elna will tell you they, they were certainly discouraged from trying to grow asparagus in Alberta because it, it wasn't really known at the time so they have put um, pictures around their display of how they grow asparagus by their farm near Innisfail how they harvest it and what they do with it afterwards and Edgars do not waste any of their asparagus. For what they cannot sell fresh or what is not saleable as a fresh product, maybe the asparagus is, the spear is too thick, they will turn it into pickles or they will turn it into relish. So they're always adding value so that nothing is ever, um, nothing is ever wasted with what they are, are selling. This little shot comes from a, an old newsletter that we used to have about 15 years ago called the, on, Gosh, I can't remember the name of it. I can see it. But anyways, it's a newsletter that we used to create. And just talking about the label and the information that is so important to include on the label, besides the fact that this information is important from a legal aspect, you also want to make sure you include this information so that people can, they know what your product is. They know where to find you. They know who you are and where to find you. They know the net quantity that's, that's in it, the size that they're looking, how to take care of a product. Um, and the ingredients that are there. So it's absolutely critical that you think of your food label as a marketing tool and a way to portray the image that you are trying to get across and your brand. And you always, always, always want them to be able to find you so that they can come back and uh, purchase from you again. Something to keep in mind if you're not aware of, the food regulation changed here in June. And if you are producing 
a food product in your home kitchen, so it's an uninspected home kitchen, and you are selling either at an Alberta approved farmer's market, or if it's just a low risk product like a jam, jelly, or pickle, or some breads and buns, you can sell those low risk products from your home, but there are requirements for additional um, labeling. So things like this was produced in a kitchen that has not been inspected and this is not for resale and making sure that your contact information is there. So making sure when you're creating your, your label and your brand that you look at both the federal and the provincial requirements that are out there. Another marketing strategy is how sampling, how important sampling is and the reality is that of how sampling helps to sell your product. And Costco doesn't line those folks up to be sampling products if they didn't honestly believe in the value of that sample and how, how much people will impulse buy. So 70% of people, this is a study that was done, 70% of people will try the food that is placed before them, they will sample, and 30% of those will buy. So that's those are really good numbers to keep in mind and how important it is for you to be able to sample. So this link that appears on this, this page um, will take you to a, an information package that Alberta Health Services has created for farmers markets, for Alberta approved farmers markets. They also have an information package for public markets. Within there, there is information on safe sampling practices. And so it's really important that you look at that and see what is required under normal circumstances. COVID kind of threw all of that out the window. And early on in when the pandemic first hit, um, sampling has absolutely been allowed, but not really encouraged. And they have required that any samples that are given out are, are within their own little throwaway containers that you're not actually handing a product to people that they're consuming on site you really want to encourage them to keep moving through the marketplace and to consume those products off site so that there is less chance of customer contamination of anything that they may touch after they have been eating a sample so there is back when i talked about the different guidance documents there is a sampling guidance document so if you are selling and you wanting, are wanting to sample during the pandemic, please look at that guidance document and also talk with a public health inspector to make sure that you're following the most current protocols. So some really uh, good reasons of why you should be sampling, the, the pros of doing this, it absolutely attracts customers. When people see that, that food being passed out to other people or available on the table, they will come over to try it and gives them that opportunity to hear your story, to find out how you make your product, to taste it, to talk to you about your product, about the packaging, about the pricing, about the size of the, the, the product that you are selling. That nose and eye appeal, you know, if you look at the lady who was selling on the sampling from the previous picture where she is heating a sausage and cooking it from raw, that smell is, is absolutely attractive to people when they're in a marketplace or within a, a farm store. Sampling will help you move your slow and or your new products that you weren't, uh, that people may be less familiar with and just gives them that opportunity to try something different and to try, try something new and gives you that chance to talk about your product. It will increase your curb appeal at the at a marketplace because it, it gives you something exciting and a reason for people to come over to your stall. Um, offering diversity of samples is important and is something that you could certainly consider doing. So sampling more than just your strawberry jam, if you have 15 different flavors of jam, sample more than just the strawberry jam and give people options to choose from. Um, this shot, was taken at a market in New York City actually. So it doesn't necessarily follow the, the safety protocols that are expected in Alberta under normal times. We don't like to see our samples just left out on a table uncovered, but they're sampling all of the different apples that they had for sale. So it gives people a chance to try them and then they the people can talk to them about these are the 
what you do with these different apples. Like these apples are good for baking and these apples are good for just for pies or for applesauce or just for eating raw. So it gives you that chance to interact more with your customers. So it's absolutely a draw to your booth, to your table, to your store. And it gives you an opportunity to cross promote with other, um, other businesses that are similar to you that could complement the product that you have. There certainly are still some drawbacks to doing some sampling that you need to keep in mind. Um, if you're known for sampling and people love to get samples from you, it, it can create a bit of a, a clog in front of your, your stall so that customers have less of a chance to get up to your, your booth and up to your table to be able to purchase directly from you because people are standing there sampling and chatting. If you have 30 or 40 vendors at a farmer's market, and 30 of or 30 of the 40 are food vendors and they're all sampling it does tend to oversaturate what's going on in the marketplace and people do tend to get a little bit tired of sampling and having samples pushed at them so you may need to use different techniques to get people to your stall increase costs for sure every time you are giving a product away it's going to cost you money um, and if you don't you know if all of your samples aren't consumed then there is that possibility that you have to throw those samples out. Alberta Health Services only likes to see samples on a table for no more than an hour. So if there's something left at the end of that hour that you need to move on, that's, that does cost you money. It makes, it makes things a little more complex for you. You need to be sure that you have um, additional products with you to make sure that you can keep things clean, that your product samples can be handed out safely, additional utensils and that sort of thing. So it does make make it more complex for you when you are sampling. Food safety is always a consideration and always a concern to keep in mind that if you are sampling a perishable product, how are you keeping it at the proper temperature so that there is no uh, risk of time temperature control being lost there and people potentially getting sick? How do you make sure that there isn't potential for customer contamination? Are you handing those products or those samples to your customers? How are you how are you going to manage that? You will need um, special permission for some products that you want to sample. So if you want to sample like the lady who was heating her sausage, when it is a perishable product like that and it's something that's being heated, you do need special permission from Alberta Health Services to make sure that you're doing it the way they want to see you doing it. It can reduce the curb appeal. So if you have a a whole bunch of people standing around your booth waiting to take a sample that can be um, reducing the curb appeal for for your your table for your stall for that part of your store and it can become a customer expectation which will in turn increase your costs so when you think about what your customers what your customers want and what is important to them um, really think about how you can exceed their expectations and when you look at your values and what is important for you in your store and and your business are you also meeting the values that your customers have and what is important to them so if it is um no gmo products and no pesticides and herbicides that are important to your customers is that how you are the products that you are selling do they meet those values are you solving a problem with the product that you are selling and, and answering that kind of a question for your, your customer? Are you offering things that go together well? And if you aren't selling things that go together well that help to round out a meal, can you cross promote with your neighbors? Can you inform your customers about your products without the masking? So when when I showed you that picture before of Edgar's and how they actually grow their asparagus and how they harvest it. Is that something that helps to inform your customers and, and gives them the information that they're looking for about how you're producing your products? So think about ways you can do that. Do you offer different ways for people to pay or is it only cash? Do you offer check or offer check, uh, credit card, debit? What other options do you have available for your customers? Um, this not to ruin perfection, Karen will talk a, a fair bit about this and show you some really good pictures, but when you are thinking about creating your perfect display, don't make it so perfect that people are uncomfortable about shopping it, that they feel like they're going to ruin this perfect display. 
And is there a way for them to receive instant gratification? And maybe that's through sampling and maybe that's through um, just smaller package sizes that they can snack as they're walking through the marketplace or walking through your, through your farm. So just some different strategies on the marketing side to think about. I want to turn it over now to Karen to talk to you about displays. Thanks very much, Eileen. Um, and I, uh, I and good morning, everybody. I'm really glad that you could join the webinar. I uh, do want to uh, just make a comment. I'm sure you're aware, but it's not only Grand Prairie potentially that is having internet issues, um, but you will have noticed that Eileen was also cutting in and out. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes talking about display tips. And more, again, most of uh, these slides will be picture based uh, to give you an idea of some of the concepts that we're talking about and then I'll move right on into signage. So the first thing to think about uh, in terms of your display is the purpose that it serves and and really the primary purpose of any display is to attract the attention of your potential customers and draw them in to actually make the purpose. So they have to attract attention, they have to be appealing to the customer's eye, and really you want them to entice the customer to, to do more than just see. You really want them um, to, to want to touch, to smell, and then of course buy the products. So there are a number of ways that you can do it. Um, the first one is use different uh, display features, different containers that your, um, that your products are, are displayed in and change the height of them so that not everything is at exactly the same level. And when you look at your display area, whether it's a table or whether it's a, a store, um, make sure that you know shelves have or at, at different heights that things are raised up a little bit. And keep in mind that most people will shop within arm's length. So arm's length basically goes from that, that um, distance between the waist and about six inches above the eyes. And looking at the average height of people, women are roughly average about 5'4", men about 5'9", perhaps 5'10". And so you want to keep that prime visual real estate space between about four and six feet because that's where people can, can easily buy. The other thing to remember is kids are smaller. So if you don't want kids touching things, go to the higher level of that, that uh, prime visual real estate. Use repetition, so repeat colors, repeat the, pack, the types of packaging that you're, um, that you're displaying your products in. Have a backdrop that pulls out the colors or, or um, complements the colors of the items that you are displaying. The previous picture was a picture of, thank you, Eileen, of corn that was in a pyramid um, shape and that pyramid shape is a really hot seller. People love that shape. But as Eileen mentioned, you don't want to build it in a perfect pyramid. So in this case, there's no, uh, it doesn't go up to the, to the tip, to the, to the top of the cone. It's been flattened off. It looks as though it's been shot. And, and it actually was designed this way. Uh, we saw this on a North America Farmers Direct Marketing Association tour a number of years ago. They designed it this way and they strategically put the sign with what the product is, corn, and the price um, so that it fits in, but it looks shocked, not perfect. So the other thing um, to Remember is to radiate displays, so spread them out, pile them high. The higher things are, are um, displayed, the more sales that you will absolutely make. And what you want to remember is when you're piling particularly perishable, perishable products like produce, for instance, when you're piling them high, you want to dummy them up so that the weight of um, of everything that is on top of the bottom layer 
does not squish the bottom layer or damage the bottom layer. And so one of the real keys is to use a pedestal, um, raising things up again to get it to that four to six um, height, a foot height is really going to increase your sales. This last picture is just a really simple example of, of putting some height into a display. Things are angled. It makes it much easier to see. You can see the display at the front, the produce displayed at the front. You can also see what is in the bushel basket. And more importantly, customers can reach it very easily. So the other thing to think about is uh, colors attract the eye. And you want to create points of attraction within your display. And so how you do that is, as this picture certainly shows, using color. But you also can do it by creating levels, by, by emphasizing corners and making them part of your display. And so you'll see in this picture that, the, the, again, the products are on an angle. The corner is rounded. It allows more people to access the corner. It makes that corner more shoppable space. And it also allows people to keep moving along so that they can see and purchase from, from the whole display. The other thing that you want to remember, whether you have a farm market or a store or whether you have a stall at a farmer's market, it's more than just your table or it's more than just the actual display unit. Use the physical space, use a back wall, use the ceiling, use lighting to bring your displays against the wall behind um, your main display area, use lighting to bring them into your display and make them part of your booth area. And then the other thing to keep in mind is make sure that you use authentic props that fit the type of product um, that you are marketing. Of course, if you're selling a perishable product, you certainly want to um, have appropriate freezer space and that the picture with the freezer, the really nice thing about it for a market uh, display is the glass tops allow the customer to see what is inside. It is your choice whether you want them to access the display or whether you want to have it as a user, um, but it really makes a difference to what people buy if they can actually see what they're buying. And this, this picture is just a, a really simple um, rendition of what authenticity um, really can add to a display. The wooden crates indicate that, yes, these were from a farm. These were from a market garden grower, a bona fide market garden grower. And they, they separate the radishes very well. Um, the, the color does not detract the eye from the red or, or the white of the radish or the greens at the bottom, but it does separate them very, very nicely. The other thing that uh, you really want to look at is where do you get ideas for displays from? Um, look around, check out your competition, talk to your friends, buy magazines, look in other sectors, walk through the hardware store, walk through the grocery store, um, walk through Costco, find out how other people are doing it and think about your setup and how you can adapt what they're doing to better to further the sales in your situation. So borrow ideas, um, you know, a, a great phrase that we always like to say is there's really nothing new in terms of marketing. You really have to beg, borrow, steal, and of course, adapt to your own needs. So check out things like garden stores. Pinterest is a great, great source of, of uh, create, creative ideas that you, that you can blend into your displays. Scrapbookers um, and scrapbooking magazines are awesome sources. And of course, um, look at some of the resources that are available um, that from the perspective of people who know the business. And so this is just one example, just about everything a retail manager needs to know by John Stanley. Um, it's got some great tips in it. This particular book, um, which, I, which Eileen has a copy of, um, this particular book has one idea um, 
per page, one category concept idea per page. It's a really easy read, really down to earth. And the really nice thing about John Stanley, he's a retail specialist, but he knows the farm direct marketing or direct to consumer market sales industry incredibly well. Okay, the next couple of pictures um, are just showing some real life uh, display options that we've seen over the years in, um, in on farm markets and farmers markets. So the really important thing to remember is keep your display open, make it accessible to the customer, make it, make it highly visible and make it attractive so that they want to come in. So you'll notice in this picture that everything, um, the main part, so the square part with the cabbage in the middle is raised and on an angle. And the potatoes at the front are set to the side, but really they're, they're set well to the side. So they're really encouraging customers who are walking by to come in and purchase the, uh, from the, the cabbage display. The other thing that I really like about this picture is red is the most um, eye appealing, eye attractive color that you can work with. And so putting red or shades of red high and towards the back really draw the eye in. So you can see the um, orange fruit on the right hand side. If if you were just looking at this picture, that is one of the areas that your eye would absolutely go to first because of the color. So think about where you're putting red in tones of red because it's certainly going to um, attract the eye to you. This is a um, picture of uh, Peas on Earth, which um, Peas on Earth is a, a family operation in the Edmonton area who sells at uh, Old Strathcona Farmers Market. And it's really important, they built their display. And so there's a couple of things that I want to bring your attention to. One is the, the false ceiling um, that they put on the top. And notice that they can use it to hang their garlic braids. Um, we've seen this in other um, displays as well. And often people put signage up there. It's high enough that when people first walk in the door of uh, your on-farm market or your store or your farmer's market, they, if they're looking for you or, or a particular area of the store, the sign will direct them where they want to go. The other thing that I really like about um, Eric and Ruby's display here is that they, again, have rounded the corners. It's stepped up, so they have three levels that they're putting their, um, their packaged produce on. And it's accessible from all the way around. There's, they've really designed it to reduce bottlenecks. Um, so congestion is removed and uh, they have a number of, of um, cash sites as well. So creativity and imagination really make the best, the best displays. And as I say, look outside your own sector for some really terrific ideas and think of the display materials that blend really well or support or complement your um, products that you're displaying. Bushel baskets are a great way um, to display small items. Again, stacked vertically, so customers of all sizes can access them really easily. Another way to do it is using wicker baskets. Uh, these are just small handled wicker baskets mounted with um, hooks on a pegboard, it works really well. Again, notice where your eye goes. It's going right to that red in the lower middle. Um, the other thing to think about is you want to create motion with your displays. And so the, the fact that the baskets, that the supports, the natural um, wood support for the tomato display, bring your eye up to the display. The red attracts your eye and then the display is on an angle. So you're seeing, your eye is seeing the whole display and moving up behind it into the um, baskets that are mounted on the pillar immediately behind it. 
So you want to create some motion in your displays. Um, and it's fairly simple to do that just by using different heights, different colors, and different materials. The um, other example that we have, again, this is a, um, a, a US example, um, but in fall pumpkin season, the feeling of abundance that comes from this display of squashes. The pumpkins are red, they're taking your eye to the display, raising it up to look at the acorn squash and the butternut squash behind. So again, it creates that, that movement, that um, visual movement in your display and encourages people to shop the whole display and of course to buy more. Okay, uh, the next thing that I really want to talk about is, and this is particularly important for people who have stores, whether they're an on-farm store, whether it's a retail outlet um, that you're selling your, your products in, or whether it's a farmer's market. But power displays really are a tool that you can use to your, to your advantage. It's really important that customers feel comfortable in your shopping space, in your market. And so one of the ways to get, to get them to feel comfortable is to make sure that you are, first of all, offering products that meet their values, that um, customers want, that they feel that they need, that they support their beliefs and their values. So they actually see additional value in the products that you're selling. It has to meet some need of your, uh, of your um, consumer. When you are looking at laying out your market or your, your farm shop, remember that many people, most people in the world are right-handed. And we have been trained um, over time to, to, to look right. Um, so most people lead with their right foot and they are more willing to turn right. So you want to lay out though, you want to position those products that are your best sellers, your top sellers, um, the things that are going to reap the highest monetary return for you, return on investment for you. Um, some on your right, and then some as you're leaving the store, the impulse ones as you're leaving the store so that you get people walking around your whole area. So basically a power display is a display that allows the customer um, to come into the shopping area, whether it's a farmer's market or whether it's a farm store, pause, look at the display, which is positioned in what we call a transition or zone or a landing zone. And that is an area that generally we just stop in. We don't, we don't actually shop in. We, we come in from the parking lot or we come in from the street. We pause to get our bearings. We are not looking to shop at this point. So we aren't actually seeing what may be displayed to the left or right or even directly in front of us in order to shop. We're just trying to get the lay of the land and make sure that this is actually a place that I as a customer want to be standing. And so what you want to have there is a display that attracts the customer's attention, makes them say, look, oh, wow, do I ever like that? I like this thought, this shop. And basically it acts like a sleeping policeman or a speed bump in the retail highway. So the next picture is a, um, it, it just a picture of a farm market. This one actually is in England. Um, the Tully farm market always had a power display immediately when you came in their um, market store, their farm market store. And this power display basically showed customers what their feature was, what was in season, and it allowed people the time to really see what was being offered before they were actually ready um, to move ahead and make the purchase. 
So one of the nice things about a power display is it gets people to stop at the front and look around. So when they look left or right, they will actually see products that they probably are interested in buying. And without the power display, they just march right on through, perhaps not even stop. Um, but if they're familiar with the store of their market, they march right on through to, to their destination vendor or their destination item, pick it up, buy it and leave. So the power display gets them looking around the whole area. And the nice thing about this display, um, in my opinion, is that, I mean, honestly, who is going to buy a 25 pound across the street? Um, I, I guess maybe if you're an institution, um, you might be interested, but in a farm store, I, uh, those really, the Brussels sprouts really are the props. Um, they, they are not the hot sell items. So they're filling the space. They're, they're the first step to get the eye to move up to see what the feature products are, those in the wagon that is authentic to the farm and actually the high return items in terms of where the profit is going to be for um, telefarm market. This um, concept really makes me think of the uh, Southwest Edmonton Farmers Market. There is a vendor there, um, uh, Ron Hamilton, who is right at the door of the Southwest, or was, I haven't been there actually for a while. He was right at the, uh, right at the entry to the Southwest Edmonton Farmers Market. He was in the transition zone and he wanted to be there. Because um, for those of you who know Ron, he's really outgoing. He is willing to start a conversation with anybody from a distance. And so he would engage people as they came in. And he actually, he actually was the market power display because he got people stopping, um, interested in what he was um, offering, buying from him, and then moving on to the next vendor. So he really was the uh, vocal sleeping policeman in that market. So the, real, the thing to keep in mind if you are looking at developing a power display for your space is to um, locate them about four steps into the store, make them circular or conical um, or with height. So this Tully example is not circular per se, but it is conical because it it is almost an inverse cone. It's wider at the top than the bottom, but there's that feeling of height. Um, the eye certainly moves up. So dummy up the base again to create height, um, also to protect um, anything that is at the lower level. Spoil the display, make it look as though it's shot. Um, so you'll notice in this one that the broccoli is not all lying in the same direction. It looks like the broccoli on the left has had customers shot from it. Look at, uh, pick it up and look at it. Hopefully take it, but perhaps put it back down. Change your power display regularly. Um, certainly if it's um, perishable products, it does have to be changed daily because um, it will lose, the products will lose their integrity. If you need it, if it's not really obvious what the products are, make sure that you sign what they are. And Keep it simple. You want it to be quick to put up. You want it to be effective. You want it to be quick to take in. Okay, uh, displays really should encourage quick and easy purchase with no lineups. So you want customers are interested in buying, in shopping quickly, and getting out, particularly in this day and age. So you really want to have two or more checkouts to reduce lineups. And you also want to have um, displays mimicked on both sides of the display area, whether that's in your farmer's market stall um, or in the case of, of um, Peas on Earth, where it was quite a large stall. They, you want to have the carrots and the potatoes at either end of that rounded stall area. So it doesn't matter where the customer lands, they can get what they need without walking um, the whole length of the of the display or without fighting tour uh, without fighting customers if it's a busy day at the market 
Um, the other thing to make sure is that place everything where the, uh, place your articles where everyone can reach. So if kids are your target market, make sure they're between three and four, four feet so that when the kids reach out their arms uh, at shoulder height, they can easily reach it. If it's if you don't want kids or dogs in outdoor markets reaching it, make sure your displays are uh, are higher beyond arm level for kids. Um, and certainly beyond muzzle level for, uh, for, for big dogs. Um, think about who your, your demographics are. If it's women, your display tables might want to be slightly lower in terms of the height of the display on the table, not necessarily in terms of the actual table. Then if you really are catering to men who uh, tend to be five or six inches higher. It just makes it easier to reach if we don't have to bend or stretch and people will be more, uh, much more willing to buy. The other thing to remember is keep those items that um, have the, offer you the best profit margin, keep them within easy eyesight and within easy reach. Any storage should be underneath and out of sight. Uh, people don't tend to look um, knee level or below, so keep it out of sight. And if you can't do that, at least keep it back, unlit, and knee level or below. Okay, now I want to spend some time looking at signage. Um, and this first picture is a picture of um, the Saskatoon Farm, which is a um, farm direct operation, a tourism operation just south of um, Calgary. The thing that you really want to consider with outdoor signage is it has to be big, it has to be very legible, it has to be simple because most outdoor signage is read when people are speeding by, often in a car at 100 or 120 kilometers an hour. Um, so it has to be clear and it really has to suit the uh, business that you're in, it really has to be authentic. If it's well known, it might be nothing more than Russell Farm Market. It might be nothing more than just the name um, and what it is. So Russell Farms, and it's a farm market. Um, it's very clear. You can see it both directions. It doesn't matter whether you're approaching from this side or from the back side. This particular sign has the same thing on both sides. It gives their hours and it gives the days that they're open. You don't often need anything more than that, particularly if it's if your operation is very visible from the road. This is another example. This is a winery over on uh, Vancouver Island. Um, this was uh, this was an old um, oak barrel that they converted into their Quite effective signage. It certainly was authentic, it certainly fit the theme of their operation. This was an on-farm directional sign, but it was right by the parking lot. So it told the customers where you were and the direction to the wine shop, which of course is the, the, their um, most profitable part of their operation. We know that signs sell. And so keep in mind that good signs sell more. And when I, what I mean by a good sign is again, big, clear, informed. Doesn't have to have a lot on it. Doesn't have to look really pretty, but it does have to look as though it was professionally done. You don't have to have it professionally done, but it, look, it does have to look as though somebody did it who knew exactly what they were doing. So the first thing that you want to do is actually develop a sign strategy. And by that, I mean, you want to have your signs inside your shop or in the farmer's market match the signs. Um, so the font and the color and any branding that you have, you want that to be consistent within the product signs within your market. The um, directional signs that direct customers to your market area or to your farmer's market and the signs on the site directing customers around your area. So you want to be consistent in your sign strategy. You want to 
develop a strategy that tells customers um, as simply as possible what they need to know, but every one of them supports the brand that you are building. You want to have a KISS strategy. Sorry, Eileen, I'm still on that slide. Um, you want to have a KISS strategy with your signs and by a KISS strategy, keep it simple, silly. Um, you want to use familiar language. You want to use a words that your customers understand and know. So for instance, instead of um, using the word pesticide, if you, are, um, if, if you have a, a market garden, you want to use the word like um, bug free. You want to have quality or sensory appeal in your signs. Um, so you want them to be colorful if it fits. You want them to have the concept of quality. So for instance, this pet food sign on the right, um, using the words human grade, fresh frozen pet food, um, is going to be really attractive to those families that see their pets as part of their family, as just another kid. If it's good enough for me to eat, it's good enough for Wally to eat. And of course, your signs have to appeal to the values um, of the customer who's buying. And they, again, the pet food sign does that very well. Okay. Have you ever been asked, what's your best seller? Um, if you have, you certainly then know it's really important to use signs to identify your best seller. And so the feature product, that red arrow goes right down to, in this case, it's new this week. It can be a best seller. It might just be a new batch this week, but if you're getting, you're using your signs to feature the product, uh, product that you want customers to see and to buy this week. So whether it's new this week, whether it's a bestseller, whether it's farmer's choice, you want to change your words with the displays. You want to have a feature product every market, uh, not necessarily the same one. And it doesn't have to be a new product. It, you just have to feature a different product. You don't even have to change the price of it. Um, I would suggest that if you're going to feature it, you probably do want to look at changing the price. Um, perhaps it's by how they're bundling or it's a slight discount. If you buy two or three or four, you um, get a card punched and you get you know, the 10th one free or something. But you want to think about how you're going to feature it. You want to only feature at most 10% of your products at any one time, and you want to rotate them. So whether that is a, a different feature every month, a different feature every market week, if you're at a farmer's market, or a different feature um, at, at, in, a different, in a category that is featured within your farm store. And remember, a category is any um, group of items. So it could be potatoes, it could be strawberries, it could be asparagus, it could be pickled asparagus. But within that, that category, um, so if the category, for instance, is pickles, is pickles this week, your feature product might be the uh, pickled asparagus. Next week, it might be pickled beets or, well, perhaps not next week. Three months from now, it might be pickled beets or pickled carrots. Um, and be creative for seconds. I mean, mentioned that with, um, with Elna Egger and the fact that she wastes absolutely none of her asparagus. Asparagus season is really short. It's only here for about a month at most six weeks. Anything that is too fat, that is crooked, that um, is too thin, that has been broken, those are the ones that are processed as well as the ones that don't sell. Um, this week at the farmer's market, um, Elna processes those so that she can sell them later. And then she features her um, pickled asparagus products, for instance, um, when fresh asparagus are not available or during special seasons like Christmas or Easter when 
um, she wants people to be aware of them so that they can incorporate them into special meals. The other thing that you can do with signs is use them to really upsell products. So in this case, these are different varieties of potatoes, a really stable product, not too exciting in many people's minds. But in addition to labeling the type of potatoes, the, there also was a sign on this display that indicated what they could be used for. So they had the type and then suburb superb for roasting, great for fries, or marvelous for mashing. So use words to develop some of that creativity and to really sell your products um, if the products cannot sell themselves. Um, bundling products and using unexpected types of packaging on products also creates a bit of a feeling of uniqueness, uh, a feeling of difference or niche. And so putting potatoes into these um, baskets that normally you see tomatoes or peaches or um, fruit in, um, berries, that kind of thing, putting potatoes in them just increases their aha value. Uh, a little bit more. Okay, the other thing to think about is um, creating a sense of urgency with signs. And so at the start of the season, make sure that you're telling people that it's new crop, um, that it's the new strawberries, that it's the king berry. You're not going to get any bigger or better than what we have now, and they're only available this week. So make sure that you do create that, that sense of, of um, urgency. Through your words, uh, first of the season, limited supply, certain varieties, limited varieties, as well as through your call for action. So by now, the season ends this week. This is your last chance to buy. But there are a couple of things to keep in mind. And so on this particular sign, a great idea, it's a really clear sign. It's a great idea because it's reusable. The downside of it, they don't clean it well. And that reflects on the image that you are portraying for your business. If they just took um, a cleaning agent and actually clean the smudge off this sign, it would make the apples much more appealing to the customer because in the customer's perspective, a crowded sign or a dirty sign is a crowded um, display or a dirty product. And that will limit the amount that will be purchased. Eileen, if you could just advance the next one. The same with this butternut nut squash sign. Again, it's a terrific sign. It clearly states what the product is. It clearly states the price. It talks about the product and how to cook it. So anybody who's not familiar with the product loses, don't have to ask questions and um, think that they might be looking um, stupid or ill-informed in the eyes of the vendor but they get the information they need about a product that they might not be available, um, they might not have had exposure to. But again, a terrific sign that they reduced, and there's this huge piece of red gorilla tape holding it up. Using a, a method to secure it um, to the um, baskets that it's hanging off of that is much less obtrusive would absolutely improve the impression of your display. Something really simple like hole punching holes in the corner and putting in short zip ties, cutting the ends off so that the ends of the zip ties are not cutting, are not hitting the customer when they're putting their hand in to pick up the squash. Something simple like that would absolutely work. Um, some of the other ideas um, that you can sell your products through signage, a product of the day. Today's special, it doesn't have to be anything different. It doesn't have to be anything different even than what is being sold today. 
It just might be packaged differently. It just might be bundled differently. You just may be buying it in groups differently. So in this case, it's a three bag, a three pound bag for $5.99. You also perhaps would have a two and a five pound bag available, but they are a different price and they're not the feature. And then the other thing I have mentioned early, earlier is any way that you can raise your product. Um, we call it pedestal magic. Doesn't actually have to be a pedestal. Cardboard boxes, wooden crates, um, um, tote boxes that are covered with a cloth. Anything to raise up your display area will give you the result of that pedestal magic and, and increase your sales. Make sure that you um, highlight what's new today. Use humor in, in your sign. So this berry one, I just love because the berries are short season. They are absolutely new today. They were picked this morning. Our berries are so fresh because they slept in their beds last night. The farmer is out um, before market setup happens, picking the berry or before their, their farm store opens, picking the berries um, and uses humor to make customers realize just how fresh they are. The tomato picture on the left is a good example of bundling different colors of products, different varieties of products to get people to say, oh, I like how that looks. I like that mix. I'm going to try it. The nice thing about this display is not every um, basket has the same mix of tomatoes in it. So customers can actually choose the um, mix that appeals to them the most. So there's a real sense of sensory appeal in this, in this display. And of course, the sense of, of urgency, um, if, you can, if you can express that in your signs, all the better. Again, something really simple as first of the season, this we're only going to be at the market another um, two weeks, or this is our last week here. When you're thinking of, um, when you are developing your signs, you want to keep them simple, as I've said many times. Nothing more than your product name, price, three benefits. So those are the three points in white, the perfect bun size, easy storage, and fast defrost in the microwave on this example. A closing motivator, um, the great for barbecues, and the six for five dollars is the price. So you're getting a package deal. Keep it really simple. Um, give them, give the customers a reason to buy. Uh, tell them what they need to know and give them additional information that will also encourage them to buy. So remember, benefits are not product features. Benefits relates back to that products that you're offering. And we often see um, hamburgers or burgers of whatever type. We often see burgers that either shrink and so the buns are too big or they are bigger than the buns and hang over the edge. Perfect bun size appeals to those people who want a, a patty that is exactly the same size after cooking than the, that the bun is. So think about your customer and develop your benefits based on, on um, what, your, what, is, what is important, what your customer values, what is important to them. Okay, the only thing actually I don't like about this sign is the background color. It's from a distance, this sign works close up, but as soon as you step away from it, it's really hard to read with the yellow on the brown tone and then the white on the on the brown tone background. But we'll get into more of that in just a minute. Okay, the other um, two other examples of, of signs uh, that have good points and bad points. The one on the left, the fresh farm raised um, meat products. I really like this sign in as much as the barn board. Uh, support. It, it's authentic to the farm image, to the products that are being sold. 
Um, really like the benefits. They're fresh, they're farm raised by local. Like that it has the uh, call, to act, call to action, order yours today, available here, here, order yours today. The things that this sign needs other signs to um, fill it out are, what is it that I'm buying? Am I buying cuts? Am I buying sides? Am I buying whole? And what are the prices? Um, so it is missing some pieces, but it's a really good eye-catching sign to get the customer in and either asking questions or reading additional signs that are on the products in the, um, in the actual display area. The one on the right, again, we saw on a, on a NAFTA tour um, one year, and this was, um, I, actually, I'm, I'm incorrect there. This one is from uh, um, Southern Ontario, just on the North Shore of um, Lake Ontario, in sort of Central Eastern Ontario. And it's a fall display. It's very eye-catching. It's very effective. However, there are some problems with it. One is the bananas. Um, this is a fall display at a farm market. We don't grow bananas in Canada. We don't even grow them in Southern Ontario, although they do grow lots of um, warm products. It doesn't tell me what the products on the, uh, just to the right of the bananas, those gourds are. It doesn't tell me what they are, use them what they're for, and they're all different shapes. So are they all different? Um, it tells me nothing about them. There's a piece of garbage right in the gourd display. It looks like an old container. Uh, really, somebody should be watching this display and picking up uh, the garbage as it happens. The first pumpkin that you see right behind the, the jam jar, jar is starting to go. Um, it, it's got a soft spot in the middle. The pumpkin display at the far right hand end is really good. It takes your eye right up, but it takes it up into the corn display and then your eye naturally moves to the right to the corn display. And then I'm thinking, what do I do with them? The sign actually told me what the, that it, that it was um, corn, but it, if I'm not the creative type, if I haven't seen it before, what, do, what am I actually gonna do with them? Um, so the display, um is certainly on the right track but it needs to be tweaked a little bit um the next two examples are uh the, the top one is an inside um display sign so it is inside a farm store and it was um the second sign so the first sign was outside and gave information about the pumpkin. and she walked into the farm market and this is the first sign we saw So it's telling you that the samples which are in the picture below are priced, saying who it is, saying what the deal is, it's four for $20. The chalkboard sign is really good in as much as it's clear, it's clean, the wording is really easy to, to read. The problem with it is it's not well lit. So it's really difficult in low light conditions if it's cloudy outside or if um, when you're walking from a sunny day outside inside, it's difficult to read what the, what the writing says, particularly the pumpkin line. The, um, the priced pumpkins in the, in the bottom picture are a terrific idea. They have to be repeated though, because as soon as you get more than, <coughs> pardon me, as soon as you get more than one person, Standing in front of, say, the $7 and the $8 pumpkins, the next people behind cannot see what the price is. So they almost have to be higher or repeated at both ends of the display. Um, the next picture depicts a uh, signboard, and signboards generally work really well. They are eye-catching, particularly if they're colorful, uh, like if there's, if there's red or some bright color to attract your eye to it. Reading the name of the company with the back 
um, with the black um, uh, filling on some of the, the printing on the top line makes it a little bit more difficult to read that name. This sign doesn't give enough information. Um, yes, it takes custom orders. Yes, it's telling you that you're buying a full side of beef, but it doesn't actually tell me what I'm getting for a full side of beef. It doesn't tell me how much beef that is. Um, it doesn't tell me whether I can decide how I want it cut. And it doesn't tell me how many, how long it's gonna last me, how much uh, my, so I have a family of four. It doesn't, if I have beef twice a week, how often, um, how, how long will the beef last in my family? So it doesn't give quite enough perspective um, on, on, the, on the sign. And there were no other signs. You had to go and talk to the vendor. There were no other signs providing additional information on this display. Um, this one is a, a really cute sign. So it really has appeal because it's at a buffalo farm. Um, it, it's actually... Um, at the Saskatoon farm and they have bison and they have Saskatoon. So it's really appealing in terms of, in terms of the image. It really fit the business. It clearly says what the product is. It says um, it's combining the Saskatoons, their, one of their feature pro uh, products with the, the buffalo meat, their other feature product into two edible, ready to eat take home products. So there is certainly some convenience in it. Um, and it very clearly indicates what the price is. What it doesn't tell is the size of the, the farmer's sausage or the pepperoni or the number of sticks or the number of patties. Doesn't say whether they're fresh or frozen. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't say who the farmer is. Now, remember, this was inside their farm store. So it was in this instance, it was fairly obvious. But if this was taken outside of the store, or in one of the uh, one of the um, ancillary buildings in the operation, you might want to be reminded who you're buying from. It does. It also does not indicate any benefits or a closing motivator to actually get people to buy a call to action. Okay, the next one is a um, it is a very effective feature um, sign from the upper crust. Um, they are advertising blueberry pie as their flavor of the month. This sign is inside in their pie display area. It's big. It is. An eight and a half by 11 laminated sign. The font size is big. You're only standing probably two, maybe two and a half feet from it. You are looking down onto it. It was very easy to read. It really appeals to um, the, the sense or, or, or our pleasure in comfort foods. Winter blahs, try them warm from your oven. And you'll get rid of this blueberry, warm blueberry pie. We'll get rid of your winter blots. I really like their tagline, taste a memory. It takes, it takes me back to my childhood when my mom would make wild blueberry pies and we'd have them. And it was always a favorite. Um, so it actually takes me back in my mind to an earlier pleasure that I had experienced and I love remembering. So it's a really good way to augment your sales. The next one is a really simple um, in-store layout. Basically, it is just three um, upright, very simple um, metal displays, but it's actually quite effective in the store in which it's positioned. The nice thing about these signs, they're easy to read. They were different heights. Um, so the ceiling signs provided uh, an overview. So on top of the sign at the very top that says homemade um, here in the piece, the other half of that said Laurel's Kitchen. It actually gave the name of the company. And then she used the same format at, on each of her shelving signs. 
And the things I really like about it, she's really clear about what each of the shelves contain. She has lots of products to choose from. She does put her best sellers on the top two shelves. So if you're looking for a specialty item, you do have to bend down. Her, the bottom shelf was duplicates of some of the top three shelves. So that really was just her storage area, but it was a nice looking storage area. The thing that I really like about these is she does put the benefits on it. 100% pure fruit. Um, spice up your meal. So it, it really gave some ideas to the consumer about how to use them and what it would mean to them. Um, some of them are sugar-free, 100% fruit. That row has no sugar, no additives. In it. Okay. Um, these are just some examples of easy to read signs. So the first thing when you're, it uh, doesn't matter whether it's an inside sign or an outside sign, you want to have the largest sign board that suits your display area. Outside signs, highway signs are 12 feet by eight feet. They are three sheets of plywood. And, and unless they have six words or less on them, when I'm driving by them, now remember I've worked, uh, I've worked with Alberta Agriculture for um, um, 39 years, so I'm not the youngest person in this webinar, but we need time and big letters in order to see. 30% white space, and, and it, the space does not have to be white. What I mean is the background, there's no writing in it. I don't have to concentrate on what it's saying. Tails on letters, the next picture will show, um, the font on it will show tails on letters. It's easiest to read mixed case, a mix of uppercase and lowercase, particularly on signs that people touch or that um, have humidity changes, so they're in the freezer or the refrigerator. You want to use color fast ink that doesn't smear. They want to be clean um, and they want to be kept clean. Okay, next slide. Sorry, Karen, Eileen's computer <laughs> died. Has died? So there will not be a next slide coming okay. up. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That pretty much is the end of the sign. Uh, and we're just about 10.30. So we didn't, we didn't, quite finish the presentation, but we certainly will send it out to people. So we'll turn it over for questions at this point. Dolores, if there are any. There is one question, but I think it's an Eileen question because it's in regards to labels, but oh, wait, maybe she's back. I don't know. Can you see her? Yes. Okay, so I'm not sure if she's going to be joining us again or not. So the, it says, do the labels have to be both in English and French? But I think that really is a, an Eileen question. It actually, uh, it depends on where they're selling. Um, the Safe Food for Canadians regulation, which uh, um, um, has most of the labeling requirements, not all, but most of the labeling requirements, does require that labels be food labels, Food labels be in English and French, unless um, if you are selling anywhere beyond your immediate municipal jurisdiction or your immediate neighboring municipal jurisdiction. So, as an example, if you are if you are selling your products, if if you are making and selling your products in the city of Edmonton, and then you want to sell them in um, Parkland county you can do that with them just labeled in english but if you want to um now i have to think of a of a community if you then want to sell them in i'm going to say um ent whistle i'm not even sure that's still in the county of parkland but if you then want to sell them in in a in a small town or village in the county of parkland they will have to be labeled in french and english so that is federal legislation. Um, it really depends on where they're being sold. There, every product does have to be labeled with the type of product it is, the net weight, um, 
So the common name, the net weight, who is the manufacturer is and how to get hold of them, ingredient listing and any allergies. Um, so there are basic labeling requirements that do have to be on the label. They do have to be in French and English, unless you're exempted. All right, Eileen, do you have more that you want to add or continue on with the presentation? We have, you know, one technical minute <laughs> left. Um, or, um, or how would you like to handle it, ladies? I do have another question that did just come through. So I can- I suggest, we, I suggest that we deal with the questions, Dolores, and then we, we send out the uh, presentations and then the very last slide will have Eileen's contact information um, and, and it will only have Eileen's contact information because I actually am leaving the department. I am retiring next week. So um, any questions should go back to Eileen. Um, and that is why we have put her contact information on the last slide. But when we send out the follow-up email, um, Eileen will be the one who sends it out so that everybody has her email contact. Excellent. Okay, so here's a question. What do you suggest when the market manager doesn't allow you to customize your area? We are only allowed to use the tables provided and can't have any items in front or behind the table. The argument is that not everyone can afford to do custom booths, so no one can. Okay, and that, um, we've certainly seen that before. And um, what I would then suggest that you do is take the time and, and again, in the email, we will send the link to the, um, um, the, the YouTube series that um, Eileen mentioned when we first started, that Jenny Birkenbosch did for us on merchandising. And she's got some really simple tips on how to personalize your table and to make your display work for you. Very inexpensive, um, but you actually then have to focus on your table. And I think you'll get some really good ideas out of that, those YouTube um, links that we will provide. All right, excellent. And Eileen cannot talk. We cannot hear her. So unfortunately, she can't tell us anything more. <laughs> This is just one of those days. So um, I suggest that we have no more questions here, Karen. So I guess, Eileen, I know you can hear me if you want to scroll forward to the your last slide that has your contact information. We can do that. If not, that's okay. Um, I would just like to say a huge thank you to both Karen and Eileen for their um, presentation scene and sharing all of their their knowledge and um, expertise with us and as you can see we had a lot more to go through yet it's just one of those things that when you're trying to condense a whole day workshop into a short webinar we, we can't always get through everything perhaps we could do it again um, but anyway, so thank you very much, Karen and Eileen. Um, after this webinar concludes, there will be a survey that appears on your screen. We would definitely appreciate you taking less than a minute to, to fill it out for us. Um, if not, if there's nothing else here, um, Merry Christmas, everybody, and stay safe and stay healthy. And thank you very much for being with us today. And there is Eileen's contact information. All right, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.